And uh, I'm going to introduce this morning's uh, speaker. Steve Jans uh, is probably known to most of you. Steve Jans is the director of Miller College of the Bible here at Sunnybrae, the Sunnybrae campus. Steve has also served as an elder here in our church, and he has uh, blessed, blessed us, blessed me and Kevin with a break um, from preaching this morning. So thank you, Steve, for that. Would you please share God's word with us this Thanks. morning? Thank you, Pastor Andy. Good morning, SCC. We're awake. We've uh, survived this week. Good. You're here, so that's, that's good news. Uh, what a delight to be able to be together on this last day of 2023, anticipating what lies ahead this coming year and hopefully uh, what the Lord uh, has laid on my heart would help us in our desire to find our satisfaction and joy in Jesus alone. So if you have your Bibles, um, I would invite you to turn to John chapter 6. If you don't, there's a pew Bible in front of you. In just a minute when we start reading this text, it'll be on the screen as well. Your pew Bible, it's page 837. <clears throat> That's John chapter 6. You can just hold your finger in there and we'll read it here in a second. Uh, so there's a new movie that just came out here a little while ago, Wonka. Anybody goes, have, have you seen Wonka? Anybody? Yeah, a few? All right. I haven't gone to see it yet. Uh, but I want to because, you know, the original Willy Wonka movie with Gene Wilder, anybody seen that one? That's the one to watch, really, not the Johnny Depp weird psychedelic, you need to be on acid to be watching that or something. I'm, not that I would know that, but it just seems weird to me. <clears throat> well, I was grade four uh, when I was um, growing up in Germany that our teacher right after lunch, would gather us around her desk, and she would read to us a book. And one of the books that she read in grade four was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. And uh, so when our boys were younger, we, I, I saw that it, um, this movie that had come out years earlier on, anybody remember VHS? We were talking about yeah, back in the, our dark ages, picked up this VHS uh, video of uh, Gene Wilder's Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Now, the story is pretty basic. It's about this little guy named Charlie Bucket, who was a good, hardworking lad, comes from a pretty poor family, though, loving, lives with his mom and both sets of grandparents, and if memory uh, is correct, I think they all sleep in one bed, which is kind of weird. They all kind of crawl into this massive... And they live in a town where this mysterious reclusive and genius guy by the name of Willy Wonka lives, but he hasn't been seen for a long time. And Willy Wonka, who is the owner of this chocolate factory, had shut things down to the public uh, simply because uh, his competitors were stealing his secrets, and he wanted to put a stop to it. But in the movie and in the book and the story, Wonka uh, um, decides to open up his factory to five lucky winners, those who find a golden ticket in one of the Wonka chocolate bars. And uh, so the story goes, there's five children who find this ticket. There's a little fat German gluttonous boy from Dusseldorf who finds a ticket, the spoiled peanut heiress, the gum-chewing bubble-blowing brat, the high-tempered television fanatic, and then, of course, Charlie. Charlie Bucket finds the last ticket. And what we observe in this movie, uh, sadly, is the epitome of the human condition. All these children want, and really all that the parents of these children want, is what, what Willy Wonka can deliver. It's not so much Willy Wonka they're interested in. They're interested in Willy Wonka, who is the means to other good stuff like chocolate and candy which I feel like I've eaten a lot over the last, oh man, come 2024, so I can set up a new resolution, right? So we're all, all going to do that tomorrow or tonight, right? And Willy Wonka himself uh, is marginalized in this story, in a sense, like he's still sort of one of the main figures, but he is marginalized in the mind and the hearts of these children, and uh, they see him simply as a means to this end and, uh, and Charlie's heart is there as well, except towards the end of the movie uh, or the end of the story where Charlie Bucket's heart does start to bend with affection towards uh, Willy Wonka. And what we find in our text this morning is a Willy Wonka-esque type story. 
It's a story of people who see Jesus as a means to an end and not an end in itself. So um, here's what I'd like us, this has been my prayer as I've been thinking about this morning, is that as we launch SEC, as we launch into 2024, would we remember, would we commit ourselves to daily remembering that Jesus is the only one who truly can satisfy the deepest longings of our heart? That we don't see Jesus as simply a means to something else, but that we would actually see Jesus as the end, the one who can bring us greatest, the greatest joy and where we can find our satisfaction completed in him alone. And so from this text this morning, and we're going to read the first 15 verses here momentarily, uh, I'd like to make two observations sort of at the front end, and then we're going to get to the main point, and then when we hit the main point, you know we're almost finished with my thoughts from this text. So this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to do something this morning. Will you stand with me as we read the first 15 verses of John chapter 6? You can follow along on the screen or in your Bibles. After this, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a large crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. They liked that, right? Verse 3. Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now that's, that's significant, but we're not going to take time to unpack the significance of this moment right here. Would encourage you to think about that and maybe do some studying. But the Passover is at hand. And then it says this, lifting, verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing a large crowd, that, that, that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, who was one of his disciples, where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? And, Philip, uh, and Jesus said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And Philip answered him and said, 200 denarii, pause, a denarii was basically a day's wage. So multiply that by 200, 200 days wages, Philip says, even 200 denarii would not buy enough food for each of them to get a little. So it's a lot of money, a lot of money put out, and even if we could buy food with that amount of money, everybody would just get maybe like a little nibble. That was Philip's reasoning. And Jesus, sorry, uh, back up. Um... Where are we? What, what verse? I've just lost it completely. <laughs> verse 8, thank you. See, that's why you have your Bibles open to help me this morning. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but, but what are they for so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there were, was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, about five thousand in number, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. Verse 12, and they, when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. <clears throat> And when the people saw the sign they, that he had done, they said, this indeed is the prophet who has come into the world. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. So, uh, interesting story, and right out of the gates, let me say, that Jesus never made any mistakes. Everything that Jesus did was very, very intentional. And he didn't do anything randomly. And the feeding of the 5,000 was not just a random act here either. He knew exactly what he was doing and why he was doing it. And the feeding of the 5,000, although done with real care, like Jesus really cared for the people that he was feeding. This is not just... This, this was just not an illustration for something down the road, which it, it is, but he really did care for these people. He produces this food. He makes bread that day, right? And he makes fish, because we know 
that five barley loaves and two fish could never feed, well, not even my family, because I've got big lads who like to eat lots of food, and, and let alone 5,000 people. But, but there is a main lesson that we're going to get to. Here, so two observations. The first observation, just as an encouragement to you, Jesus cares for you. Jesus cares for you. Now, this is a narrative, and so we need to be careful that we don't uh, extrapolate something out of this text that's not there. But just like Jesus cares for the people in this story, can I remind you this morning, SCC, and as you launch into 2024, that Jesus really does care for you. And so when the difficulties come, and they will this year, just preach that to yourself. No, even though my circumstances might not be good, maybe I've lost somebody that I really love, maybe I've been diagnosed with something, whatever might, maybe financially things are tight and don't, can't figure out why or, or something's happened to me, remember that Jesus cares. And he did, he cared here too. It, it could not be more clear uh, that he, like in verse 2 it says he was healing the sick, and in verse 3 he lifts up his eyes and he sees the large crowd, and, and he cares and he produces food for these people because he cares. So that's just one short observation. Here's a second observation. We'll spend a bit more time on this one. <clears throat> Jesus will give you good gifts, like fish and bread. Jesus will give you good gifts so that you would glorify God through these gifts. Do not miss this point in this text, and it will come to fruition later on as we read this. But Jesus actually gives us good temporary gifts like bread and fish so that through those things we might actually bring glory to God. It says in verse 14, when the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet, the prophet, the Messiah. They understood that this, he was the Messiah who has come into this world. And my guess was, doesn't say this in the text, but that evening when the people dispersed and they were sitting in their homes, though they would have been impressed with the bread and the fish, and they might have talked about how good the bread was or what kind of fish they'd eaten, my guess is that they didn't spend a bunch of time talking about the food, but they probably spent time talking about the giver of the food, would be my guess. And... So we must, with good gifts that God... I mean, isn't this appropriate? We've just come through Christmas. You sat around the tree, I'm guessing, for some of you, any or most of you, and you exchanged gifts, and we received gifts from people that love us, and and God gives us these gifts, but not as an end in themselves, but simply a springboard to something else. Now, back in the 1600s, the Reformers totally got this idea of using the things that God's given us as a springboard to make much of God. In the Westminster Shorter Catechism, this was simply a, a, a book of teaching, a way to train young people, children, in the doctrines and the truths of God. And the very first question, so there would be a question that would be posed, and then there would be a, a, the right answer that was given with biblical subtext to that. So this is not just random stuff. These were... These were truths that are found in the Bible. And the first question is this, what is the chief end of man? The answer is, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. So your main purpose this coming year, 2024, is to make much of God, to make much of him. And that's what the word glorify means, is is that we live in such a way that people would see in our lives that we serve a great God. To glorify God means to shine the spotlight on his glory, on, on, on how beautiful he is, on his splendor. And he is a beautiful God. Look around. We live in one of the most beautiful parts of the world. He created this. And so if he created the shoe swap, what kind of beauty must be in him himself for him to create something as beautiful as where we live To glorify God means that we portray his greatness, that in your life, when people look at you this year, they might not just stop with you, but that you would simply be a conduit for people to think about something else, namely, God himself. To glorify God means to display his renown. And and Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, therefore, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. And in this story, in John chapter 6, they were eating, and the result was 
that they recognized who he was and they made much of him. They glorified God in a very clear way. So every part of our life should simply be a launching pad uh, to see, to re rejoice in, to exalt in God's goodness and his glory, to make much of him, to shine the spotlight on him. Are you doing that? Just what you desire in your life, that when people look at you, they would look beyond yourself and the things that you can do, but that they'd actually see the God behind the scene who is not visible, right? He's spirit, but he lives in us by his Holy Spirit, and he produces Jesus in us, that people would see that in your life? Is that, is that your desire? Is that your longing? Well, that's my desire, and I hope it is as you move into this coming year as well. So let me just pause and, and illustrate this a little bit in terms of how do we live our lives so that we would simply be a, a launching pad in our own hearts that we would think about who God is in sort of the everyday kind of stuff, like eating and drinking. There's nothing more basic than eating and drinking. Would you agree? Maybe sleeping and occasionally having to use the restroom. Kind of basic stuff, right? So babies do. They eat, they sleep, they cry, and their diapers need to be changed. And so that's sort of the basic part of life. And so let me, let, let me ask you to ponder for a moment the senses that God has given us. We've got five senses, right? You're looking at me, so that means you're seeing. Some of you might not be able to see in color because you're colorblind, but most of you can see relatively well. And uh, some of you have glasses on so that you can, you know, high definition was invented by God, not by Sony or LG. He created it, and though we live in a sinful world, we see the effects of that with our eyes. Sometimes things get a bit blurry, but we, we can see and we can taste, and we can hear and we can smell and we can feel, right? Even right now, I feel a little bit of breeze on my face because God's created me with these senses. These senses are not a mistake, God did not create you with these senses just as a mistake. He wants you to use these in such a way that you would make much of him. Seeing, for example, our, our eye, we could take time to study the intricacies of our eyeball. There, in each of your eyeballs, the back, there are 1.7 million nerves that run from the back of your eyeball to your brain so that you can see this morning. One 0.7 million fibers in each of your eyes. That's not a mistake that you can see this morning. The Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. How do we know that? Because we look with our eyes into the sky where there's not a lot of ambient light and the moon's not shining and we can see the Milky Way with our eyes. And so it's through the eyes that God has given us, this sense of seeing, that we now in turn can make much of who our God is. Tasting. Uh, we have on our tongue these things called microvilli. They're taste buds. And uh, the average person, which is you, has about 10,000 taste buds or 10,000 microvilli. Which, and a microvilli is simply, I'm not a scientist, but I've read this, is simply a little hair... So you got like 10,000 hairs on your tongue. Do you ever get a hair in your throat and it's like you start gagging? I'll just think about this for a, a, a moment. You have 10,000 little hairs in your mouth. Don't start gagging now. <laughs> Melissa's already going. <laughs> um, and these little microbes get replaced every 10 to 14 days. So that when you put something in your mouth, you can taste sweet or sour or bitter or, what's the last one? What is it? Salty. Salty. We need something savory, right? So, so, so God created your tongue so that you could experience all these wonderful things. Question, could God have created you without taste buds? Yes. Could he have figured out a different means by which you would get energy? Like, plug into the ground somehow. There's some sort of a hose coming out of the side of your chest and you plug it in, you get some energy from the ground, and you keep going for another day, right? He could, he could have done something like that. He didn't. He gave, you a, he gave you a tongue with taste buds so you could taste sweet and salty and sour and bitter. It's not a mistake. And yet we go through life just thinking these are just normal everyday. No, no, no. God did this on purpose. 
so that when you eat or drink, you might what? Glorify God. That's what the Bible says. And Jesus gives these people fish and bread. And what do they do with that? They glorify Jesus with that. So we make much of Jesus through the senses he's given us. Smelling. We've got in our nose these things called receptor neurons that send signals to our brain, right? And, um, and so we smell different things. I love, there are some, there are some days that I'm not keen on driving through on the Salmon River Road. <laughs> right? Some days when the manure is being, being spread. But, 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 but it's those days that I, when I smell it coming into town and I got to get to Vernon, if I get a whiff of that, I'm going to stay away from that valley. <laughs> right? <laughs> Why? Because I smell something. But oh, there are some days I love driving on the Salmon River Road. Like when, when freshly cut hay is lying in the fields. I don't know, unless you have hay fever, that there are a lot of things that smell better than freshly cut grass or hay that's in the field. I was driving, I was thinking about this stuff, this was years ago already, and uh, with our staff driving to Starbucks for a staff meeting in Winnipeg, and I asked the, my staff who was in the car, we're driving together, I said, and, and this was June, driving down Pandora Avenue, there's a guy mowing his lawn, and we drive past, the windows are down, and we smell freshly cut grass. And they're common. It's, ah, oh, that smells so good, you know, it's spring. So I asked the question, and they knew the answer. I said, could God have created us without the ability to smell? Answer, of course he could have. But he didn't. So that Christian, when you smell a blade of grass that's cut in half, which emits an odor, a beautiful odor, and it hits your nose, you should do something with that. Namely, you should glorify God. You should smell cut grass or a fresh cup of coffee. You should eat a good steak or hear beautiful music differently than an atheist, Christian. All these senses that God has given you should be simply a springboard for you to make much of God. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Make much of him. There's a, a, a hymn writer who you know, maybe not by name, but you know his hymn, that totally understood this concept. And the song goes like this. I'm not going to sing it. I'll give you the words. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. Watch now. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Stanza two goes like this. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees, when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and see the brook and feel the gentle breeze, what happens? What do I do? Then sings my soul, my Savior, God, to thee. How great thou art. So God gives you good gifts. He's going to give you good gifts this year, some of you. He has given you good gifts in 2023. And our duty as followers of Jesus is to glorify him with those good gifts that he's given us. So every day, allow the good gifts that God gives you to act as a springboard for your heart and for your mind to go Godward so that you would glorify. Now, there's two phrases in this text that I just want to point out, and then we're going to get to the main point. The first phrase is in verse 6, where it says, these are important phrases, little words in the Bible matter. Like, there are no words that are in this book by mistake. This is the inerrant, infallible word of God. We trust it. And so even little phrases, even little words matter to us. And here's the first phrase, verse 6, for he himself knew what he would do. The feeding of the 5,000 was not just a random circumstance in Jesus' life. He knew exactly what he was going to do. It says it in our text. And he did it with, I think, tomorrow in mind. He was feeding the 5,000 with something to anticipate the next day, which we're going to see in a minute. But Jesus never made mistakes, and never did he do anything randomly. He didn't do anything without being led by the Holy Spirit. 
He never did anything without thought. He knew exactly what he was going to do. And Jesus planned and executed the feeding of the 5,000 so that a a greater lesson might be taught the next day. So here's the question that I'd like you to ponder for just a moment. Could it be that God gives you and me good gifts, gives us temporary gifts like food, so that we would understand what it's like to be satisfied, even temporarily? What does it feel like to be satisfied, right? And, and so that as we have this small taste of satisfaction in our life, it might move our hearts to say, I want more than temporary satisfaction. I want to be satisfied my whole life, not just after a good meal or watching a good movie or whatever it might be, these temporary things that bring satisfaction for a moment. Could it be that God gives us these little temporary gifts, like five barley loaves and two fish, so that we might consider... Man, I actually want to be more satisfied than what this has to offer. Here's the second phrase, or the the two phrases that I want you to see. Verse 11 and verse 12. This is what it says in verse 11. Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also fish, watch now, as much as they wanted. Then in verse 12 it says, And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. And of course, they gathered more stuff than was there in the first place, right? Twelve baskets full of food. Like I said, these words words are intentional. Uh, Growing up as a missionary kid, uh, my mom and dad, uh, they were not wealthy, uh, but they were generous. They were a generous, I, I grew up in a generous home, and my mom, I think, would, I would consider her to have the gift of hospitality, or at the very least, was very intentional about what hospitality looked like in our home. And so we'd have people over all the time, and <clears throat> this happened all the time growing up, especially as I was growing a bit larger. Mom would pull me into the kitchen before company would come, and she would say, now, Stephen, go easy on the meat, or we don't have a lot of potatoes, so let the guests have the food first, right? Anybody else experience that growing up? Just kind of go easy on it. Yeah, there you go, right? This is not that story. This story says they ate as much as they wanted. Jesus didn't say, I'm going to bless this food. Now just kind of remember everybody else around you. We've got 5,000 plus people here. So just take a little bit. And if there's seconds, we'll pass it around again. It doesn't say that. Eat as much. And it says when they had eaten their fill. This is important because you need to know when the people left that day, they were absolutely and fully satisfied with the food. For how long? Well, the text tells us that the next day, they were hungry. It's kind of like pushing away from, you know, Christmas dinner a couple days ago. You push back and you say, ah, I'm so full. I'm never going to eat another thing in my life. Four hours later, I got a hankering for a turkey sandwich. Where's the turkey? What'd you do with it, Sarah? Right? It's short-lived. It's, it's, you know, I'm fully satisfied, but So here's the main lesson that I want you to hear this morning. Jesus gives us good gifts, temporary gifts, gifts that will be fleeting, that will bring short-lived and temporary satisfaction in order to give us a small taste of what it is to be satisfied so that Christian and those of you who might not know Jesus yet, that your hearts would begin to long for and desire full and eternal satisfaction. So you get these little glimpses of what it means to be satisfied, but, but they never fully satisfy. No matter what you get in this world, it never fully satisfies. The next day you're hungry again, or a few hours later, or the new car smell in your car wears out and you need a new car to get that smell again, or whatever it is, right? Whatever your thing is. And so we remember that these are small gifts, but they should move us to say, I want to know what True satisfaction is. Now, the last part of the story, and you'll see where we're going. Verse 22. On the next day, the crowd that remained on the other side of the sea saw that there had been only one boat there, and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone away alone. Other boats from Tiberias came near the place where they'd eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the boats 
and went to Capernaum seeking Jesus. Why were they seeking Jesus? Because he had fed them. They wanted to be fed again. They liked this. Jesus is delivering the goods. Let's go find this guy. Verse 25, when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Then there's this dialogue back and forth, and they're real connivers. They're looking for more, right? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw, you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. There it is again. They ate till they were full. Do not labor for the food that perishes. Or you could say, do not labor for the temporary satisfactions in life. That's what he's getting at. But for the food that endures, the satisfaction that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, for on him God the Father has set his seal. And then they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And they're still thinking horizontal. They're thinking, thinking like earthly, temporary. Give us more food, Jesus. And Jesus says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him, trust in him whom he has sent. And so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we might see and believe you? Hint, hint, wink, wink, more food would be great, Jesus. What work do you perform? What kind of miracle could you pull out of your hat today, Jesus? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, sir, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, and here is the main point, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus satisfies. And this is the gospel. To eat Jesus means to trust him alone. Nothing else to give us life to fulfill his promises, to satisfy us, to save us from our feeble attempts of looking to be satisfied. And Jesus comes to this world as a baby. We just celebrated that. He comes to save us. He goes to the cross to take my sin and your sin upon himself. And he bears the full wrath against my sin and your sin on himself, the punishment for my sin. He's buried in a tomb. And three days later, he rises from the dead, conquers sin, defeats death, and now he invites us to himself. And as we turn to him as our soul satisfying bread of life, he offers us new life and a, a lasting satisfaction. He reconciles us to himself so that we could agree with the psalmist who says, you've made known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. You will truly satisfy. So, SEC. Let me encourage you, as we launch into 2024, pursue Jesus as your ultimate satisfier. You might have some goals, temporary goals. Don't bank your life on those. They're going to, next, in 2025, they're going to be done. It's over. But there's an eternity that we wait for. And in the meantime, Jesus will satisfy us. This year, pursue Jesus as the ultimate joy in your life. And, and with all of the temporary gifts that God has given you, follower of Jesus, use those as a launching pad to make much of him in your life. But remember, they're only temporary and should only move our affections Godward.